instead of talking about the very recent work, I decided to talk about this slightly older work. The uh, main themes uh, running through it are localization, uh, liquids, and strong correlations. So I thought it would be entirely appropriate that even though I'm not really talking about localization, I would like to talk about transport beyond the Boltzmann equation, which was certainly part of Yang of Four. Uh, I'm not talking about classical fluids that are freezing, but I would like to talk about quantum fluids. And I would like to talk about quantum fluids that are extremely strongly correlated. So that's why I decided to choose to speak on this topic. So uh, I think as Peter said, uh, since this is a sort of mixed audience, much of my talk will be introduction, but so be it. I will come to some uh, results uh, by the end of the talk anyway. So I'll start with an introduction and motivation, talk about a review of BCS-BC crossover, some very beautiful exact results uh, on uh, relations between thermodynamics, correlations, spectroscopy, and come to viscosity. So the reason I think the work uh, on viscosity even needs an introduction is because I think this is a topic which uh, is usually only taught to engineers and not to physicists any longer, unfortunately. Uh, but my motivation for studying this is because I spent a large fraction of my career thinking about quantum phases which do not support sharp quasi particles, and this is a problem that faces us in many, many different areas of solid state physics, most strikingly in the normal state of the high temperature superconductors, also in quantum critical regimes. But rather remarkably, this is also a problem that's facing uh, nuclear physicists who are working on relativistic heavy ion colliders and even string theorists who are talking about ADS CFT. But I am firmly going to uh, focus on the unitary Fermi gaps in the PCS BC crossover, where I feel some of the most uh, detailed experiments on viscosity will happen. I will mention some uh, connections with these areas as I go along. So since uh, the cold film gases that I'm going to talk about are neutral fluids, the transport coefficients in such charged neutral fluids is the shear viscosity eta, the bulk viscosity zeta, and uh, the thermal conductivity kappa. And uh, much of the work that has happened, at, at least at the moment, both in experiment and theory, is without thermal gradients, so I will not talk about thermal conductivity and focus just on the viscosity. So the viscosity first appeared, I guess, uh, as a phenomenological parameter in the celebrated Navier-Stokes equation, where uh, these two coefficients, eta and zeta, appear, and they basically give rise to dissipation when you have a fluid flow. So let's recall what shear viscosity is. Uh, if you have a fluid flowing uh, with a stationary uh, solid surface there, then the flow gradient is set up so that the velocity of the fluid at the surface is zero, which is why fans in India, this is very new, but I remember the 10 years I spent in Tata Institute, even the fans are wearing, the fans are very dirty because uh, of viscosity actually, the flow velocity there goes to zero. Or if you live in a rainy place like Mumbai or Columbus, if you're flying and you see on the pane of your airplane as you're landing, the small droplets of water move much slower than the large droplets of water. Yeah. So that's what it is. So the shear force is given by the viscosity eta times the strain rate. U is a velocity here. Okay, and this elementary example just simply tells you that uh, the units of viscosity are newton per meter squared second, and often uh, this is written in terms of the unit poise after Mr. Bourgeois, who showed that the flow rate in a pipe is proportional to the pressure gradient across it with viscosity in the denominator. And remarkably, it goes like the fourth power of the radius, which is much to do with blood pressure. Okay? Uh, so eta, despite appearances, you will see later on when I do Boltzmann and Kubo, it's fine. Okay. Thank you. So eta, uh, when I do Boltzmann or Kubo, it will look like it's related to a mean tree path or a current current correlation, but it's very important to bear in mind that it really is a resistivity and it's not a conductivity. So as I said, it's related to dissipation. Uh, when you have a flow gradient, then the rate of energy dissipated is governed by the shear viscosity eta. And the bulk viscosity, which is 
uh, less discussed but will play an important role later on, is when you have a uniform volume change without a shape change, so you have the divergence of the flow field, then the energy dis uh, dissipation is governed by the bulk viscosity zeta. So uh, up till uh, that point, these were merely phenomenological parameters. And it was these gentlemen who first decided to ask, can we provide a microscopic theory of what these phenomenological parameters are? And Maxwell was the first one to show that in the kinetic theory of dilute gases, the shear viscosity is the density times the characteristic momentum times a mean free path. This is where the concept of the mean free path was introduced. And then Maxwell saw that the mean free path is just given by 1 over the density times the collision cross-section of molecules, A squared, their size. So the density cancels out. And so he deduced theoretically that eta is independent of the density of pressure for a dilute gas, only dependent on the temperature through the mean momentum. And he was very surprised by this because this was not at all what he had expected. And so apparently, and my only source for this is Wikipedia, he and his wife did an experiment to check that this was indeed the case. Okay? And this found that he was right. Now, of course, by now we know that this Boltzmann equation approach has been successfully generalized. Not that we really have dilute gases, but very often we have dilute gases of quasi-particles. Okay? So even very strongly interacting systems like helium-3 or helium-4, you can use this in appropriate regimes, provided you have sharp quasi-particles. In other words, the mean free path is much, much greater than the wavelength. So if that is true, that the mean free path is much, much greater than the wavelength, then you immediately see from a kinetic theory-like argument that the shear viscosity divided by the entropy by the number density must be much, much larger than h bar. This might lead you to a conjecture that perhaps if you had very strong interactions and if the mean free path were to become very small, comparable to the characteristic wavelength, then you would be in a very low viscosity regime. And so a minimum mean free path might lead to a minimum viscosity. Now, uh, Actually, Ed Purcell, in a very famous biophysics paper, noticed that. And he found that there seems to be a minimum in the viscosities of all known fluids. And he didn't understand that. Okay. Now, the analogous question can also be asked in electrical transport, where this goes under the name of the minimum metallic conductivity of Mott, or the Doppler-Rayleigh criterion. And experiments have now shown us that this is simply false in high temperature incoherent transport. And here I show you strontium ruthenate. And so you just simply sail through the Mach minimum metallic conductivity. And Boltzmann theory is obviously wrong, but nature couldn't care less. However, for viscosity, uh, uh, these gentlemen, Dan Son and collaborators, made a very beautiful conjecture, which is not dissimilar to this a Mach minimum metallic conductivity conjecture, except they are not making a Boltzmann-based attack on the problem. They are actually solving a problem that I guess I, or most of you in the room, are not particularly interested in, which would be the n equals 4 supersymmetric Yang-Mills theory. And they had the tools of the ABS-CFT duality to solve this very strongly interacting supersymmetric conformal field theory. And they found that eta divided by s was indeed h bar divided by 4 pi kb. So in this particular problem, there is no conserved charge density. So they were not looking at eta divided by n. The natural thing was to look at the entropy density. That's why you get h bar divided by kb, and you even get a 4 pi. And then they made this boring conjecture that for all fluids, the shear viscosity to entropy density ratio obeys this inequality. Okay. Now, the status of this bound string theory is apparently unclear. People have been able to violate it in little ways, but there still seems to be some bound. It's just a question of whether the number is 1 over 4 pi or something a little smaller. However, much more interesting to me, since I'm interested in real fluids, okay, not supersymmetric fluids with gauge fields, etc., etc., there are absolutely no known violations of this in the laboratory. 
So let's look at some numbers, okay? So if I look at water, honey, molasses, lard, here are the numbers in centipoise. And in fact, you can study very, very high viscosity fuels, which is a very interesting subject, the glass transition. But that's not what I'm interested in, because actually I want to look at very low viscosity fuels. Okay? This, is a very con this is a very classical problem, and I'm interested in the opposite quantum limit. So you might say, well, why not look at helium-4? Because that's one of the best studied quantum fluids. And actually, we know that the superfluid has zero shear viscosity. Now, uh, one has to be a little careful about how one actually measures it. So this is probably one of the best measurements of eta in superfluid helium-4. And what you find is even below the lambda transition, you don't get zero eta. What you in fact find is that the shear viscosity diverges as you go to the temperatures. And if you make a kinetic theory picture of this, this was in fact predicted by Landa and Kalatnikov. So that it's only phonons that contribute to it. The number of phonons are going down like T cubed. However, the phonon-phonon interactions which determine the mean free path are so becoming so rare that the mean free path is diverging faster than T cubed, which is why eta goes up. Yes, so you could do that too, but what I'm saying is uh, the normal fluid excitations are determined eta even below the lambda transition. And so uh, what I'm saying is we really want to look at normal fluid etas rather than the fact that the superfluid component has a zero eta. So here is a list of uh, eta and eta or n and eta or s for a variety of systems, water, helium-4, etc. And what is quite remarkable, and I think not particularly well understood, is that the two fluids that come closest to saturating the string theory bound for whatever it is worth are ones that are the hottest fluid ever made in this earth, the quagluon plasma, and amongst the coldest fluid ever made in the lab. The temperatures differ by 18 orders of magnitude. The shear viscosity is different by 6 orders of magnitude, yet those ratios are very close together. So somehow, these are very strongly interacting states of matter, and I will, of course, focus on this one. Say again? It's 1 over 4 pi. Yeah. So anyway, so one is trying to understand why this is true. One has to look at quantum regimes. One has to look at very strong interactions beyond uh, the validity of Boltzmann or probably just at. And as you'll see later on, we also want to look at scale invariant or formal invariant theories. OK, so the, the setting in which uh, this kind of physics is likely to be studied in most detail with many different experiments is the problem of the BCS, BDC crossover and strongly interacting Fermi gases. So I'm going to take a slight diversion uh, and spend about five minutes discussing that before coming back to its viscosity. So these are ultra cold Fermi gases, uh, either with lithium-6 or with potassium-40. Uh, typical experiments have a million atoms, give or take a factor of 10. They're extremely dilute with a Fermi energy, which is on the scale of 100 nanokelvin to 1 millikelvin. And uh, the experiment list, uh, of which there are many all over the world, in Europe and the United States, have gone down to roughly, I would say, 10% of the Fermi energy, so deep into uh, the superfluid state also, but certainly deep into the degenerate regime. So you have two species of fermion, which everyone calls spin up and spin down, even though these are two hyperfine states. And the beauty of this field is that unlike the solid state where we just have to live with whatever attractive interaction the solid provides to us, here the attractive interaction between the fermions is tunable. So you tell the experiment list how much attraction you want, they'll set their dial, and there you are. Okay. And this they do through a magic of the fresh rock resonance, uh, which I will explain in a grossly oversimplified but perfectly adequate way in the next transparency. Okay? And the other beauty is that the results, when expressed appropriately, are completely independent of microscopic details which fermion is used, and they just scale functions of the temperature of the Fermi energy and one over 10. So what is the scattering length A? 
So instead of telling you what the flash rock resonance is, I'll just remind you what the scattering length V is and what it does as I change the attraction in the system. And this simple-minded picture is perfectly good. So if I consider an attractive potential, you can consider anything. With a finite range, let's consider a square of L R naught with a depth negative V naught. So then, as I crank up the depth V naught, there is a single parameter A whose variation is plotted on that graph which determines the low energy scattering cross-section. So in general, uh, if I'm looking at the low energy cross-section where Q, the center of mass momentum, is much, much less than the inverse range of the potential, and of course, sigma just goes like A squared. But when A diverges, as it does, then of course, the cross-section is not 4 pi over A squared, cannot diverge. It actually goes like 4 pi over Q squared, okay, which is the unitary limit for scattering. And that's why the point at which the scattering length diverges is called the unitary point, and such a Fermi gas called the unitary Fermi gas. So when does that happen? In the two-body problem in vacuum, which I have shown there, that happens precisely at the point at which you cross the threshold for two-body bound state formation. Okay? So for negative A, there are no bound states, for positive A, I get a bound state, and as I crank up the attraction even further, the bound state will be So uh, the problem on the board then is uh, fermions uh, with a mass m, these are non-relativistic, a chemical potential mu, which determines the density, and an attractive interaction, which depends on a momentum cutoff, which is the inverse range, but at the end of the day, the only way in which this complicated attraction is going to enter the answer is through the scattering lens. So there's a single dimensionless coupling constant, one over KFA in the problem. So uh, this problem was first uh, sort of discussed by Tony Leggett many decades ago. And what he showed was that when you look at this problem as a function of one over KFAS, negative A with no bound state, A equals infinity threshold, and A greater than zero with a deep bound state. Basically, the problem just goes from a BCS superconductor with a weak attractive interaction, unable to form a bound state in vacuum, but nevertheless giving you cooperative Cooper pairing with huge Cooper pairs, just as BCS told us. In the other extreme, when I have tightly bound states, that attraction is resolved by forming molecules. Those molecules look like bosons, and the ground state consists of a Bose condensate of those bosons. And actually, nothing particularly dramatic happens. This is a smooth crossover, just as from day to night is a smooth crossover, even though night and day are very different, as are these two opposite limits. Okay. In between at unitarity, you have a pair-sized comparable to interparticle spacing and a very strongly interacting gas. So this is very worth emphasizing, that if you look at the bare attraction, it's monotonically increasing as I go from the left to the right. But even in that very strongly attractive limit, once I form the molecules, the effective interaction between those molecules is very weak. So both limits are actually weak coupling problems. And right here at unitarity, is where I have as strongly interacting a state of matter as I can imagine having. And a lot of the interest is precisely in understanding that. OK, so here is a early phase diagram. Okay, And one of the interesting features of this 1 over KFA temperature plane is that the transition temperatures for pairing and superfluidity are on the scale of TC over bare EF of order 20 percent. Now, of course, the actual EF is tiny, so in Kelvin, this number is very, very low. But as a ratio, this is probably as large as something that has been seen in the lab. And uh, if this could be done in the solid state, uh, everyone would be delighted. Okay? We have no idea how to do that. Okay. The other thing is, if you look at the normal system, remaining always about TC, then over here in the BCS limit, you have a normal Fermi gas. Over here in the BEC limit, you have a normal Bose gas. And what happens as I go about TC from a normal Fermi gas to a normal Bose gas, and in some early work, 
uh, we have shown that actually this is a place where we're likely to see a pairing pseudo gap, and there is very recent quantum Monte Carlo, which actually uh, looks at this problem in great detail, and I will show you some uh, uh, some experimental data as well. But here is where uh, the quasi particles are very indefined, and here is where the viscosity problem will also uh, be most interesting. So to make a connection with ADS-CFT, uh, let's take the temperature coupling constant. Let's stick to unitarity, where the coupling length is divergent. And let's actually take an axis out of the board, which is the chemical potential. Now suppose I tune the chemical potential to zero, at which point my density has gone to zero. So at this point, I have no scale in the problem whatsoever. The scattering length is divergent, the temperature is zero, and the chemical potential is zero. So this point outside the board is a quantum critical point, and in fact, as Dan Sorn pointed out, actually you can write down a non-relativistic conforming field theory to describe this point. However, our string theory friends, like Sorn and others, have not yet been able to find an appropriate ABS dual to this non-relativistic conforming field theory. So at least at the moment, ABS-CFD has shed absolutely no light on the problem of uh, the unitary Fermi gas and the BCS-BC crossover. So if, if this was all theory land, perhaps I wouldn't be so excited. But it's not. You know, Some of the most beautiful experiments in recent times, here is a rotating Fermi gases seeing an abricosol lattice with quantized vortices, and a whole slew of experiments, and a lot of these universal results that I talked about have been checked. So let me go and show you two of these. So one of them is the observation of a pairing pseudo gap, or an energy gap in the normal state near unitarity. This is very beautiful work of Debbie Jin and collaborators at Jilla, where they have now done the analog of angular resolved RF, so the analog of angular result photo emission spectroscopy, RPS, by using RF spectroscopy. And this is energy versus momentum. And the false color plot, which is, of course, all energies or temperatures, they look at the damping of a certain collective mode, and that tells them something about the and you can see that, that here is eta over s, that here is the string theory bound, and they seem to come pretty close to it. Now, for the last bit of introduction, uh, and some of my work as well. So here I want to tell you about uh, some work on... Yes, sure. No. 1 over 4 pi? Let's say it's 1 to 1. So it's less than around 1.1. 1. 1. Just below. The limits number. The limits number is another ratio of transport constant. Correct. This is not a ratio of two transport constants in which a mean free path yeah. cancelled out. This is a ratio of a transport constant to a thermodynamic variable. So it's a rather different kind of thing. Okay? Okay. So now I want to describe some work which was pioneered by Sheena Tan, which are called the Tan relations. And these are exact relations valid for the strongly interacting gas in which the large momentum high frequency behavior of correlation functions is related to thermodynamic properties. And these exact relations will be important for the viscosity some means if I ever get there. So let me speed up here, okay? So in the two-body problem in vacuum, uh, there's a Baker piles boundary condition at short distances. And that basically determines the short distance or the large momentum behavior of various correlation functions. So the density density correlation function simply inherits this from the two-body problem. So somehow the singular behavior, for instance, in a momentum distribution, you get k to the fourth, is determined by two-body physics. But the coefficient of the singular behavior is the same coefficient c which is going to appear again and again and again in the subsequent slides, which is a constant, no, it's, a, it's a function of temperature over epsilon Fermi and 1 over KFA, this contains a lot of many body physics information. And the most beautiful way to do this is in terms of product expectations. 
But the same contact coefficient c also enters into uh, the high frequency, high momentum tails of single particle spectral functions, the high frequency tail of the RF intensity, and the high frequency behavior of the dynamic structure factor. And you might say, that's all very well and good, but I don't care so much about high frequency and high momentum behavior of things. Now the beauty is that the same C actually determines all of thermodynamics as well, okay? So let me show you that. So if you just write down the kinetic energy, that would be k squared times the momentum distribution summed over k. It is five powers of k upstairs, and in the ultraviolet, four powers downstairs. So this is a divergent quantity. But I'm sure that you get rid of the divergence by taking out the tail, and all that enters then is C divided by four pi ma. Or he produced a pressure relation. For non-interacting gas, pressure is two-thirds energy density. The interaction piece enters only as contact divided by A, and so on, okay? The adiabatic derivative of the energy just gives you contact. So as my colleague Eric Bratton says, this is the tail that wags the whole dog. Okay, and this too has experimental significance. So Bebedian's group has measured the large K tail of the momentum distribution, the large omega tail of RF, and also from angle resolved photo emission, and plotted C as a function of one over QFA. They've also tested the thermodynamics and experiments. So now, at long last, I'm ready to return to the problem of viscosity, which I introduced. I have 10 minutes. Okay, I think I should do it. So this is work done with my postdoc by Taylor, some of it unpublished. So actually we have exact non-perturbative results for Bose and Fermi fluids with isotropic pair potentials, all temperatures, all states of matter. But here I'm simply going to focus on Fermi gas and the CSBEC crossover. So what can you do which is exact and non-perturbative and goes beyond Boltzmann? Well, you can do linear response and you can do sum rules. And these sum rules, as we know from solid state physics, often give you a huge amount of insight because they really are exact. So let me talk about that. So uh, what one can do is, one can do a linear response to an imposed flow. So I put a velocity gradient with an e to the i omega t and compute the relevant correlation function about which I can tell you a lot in private if you want to know and compute the shear and bulk viscosity correlation functions using standard methods. So actually, uh, it's easiest to write down everything in terms of current, current correlation functions, which are much easier to manipulate rather than stress, stress correlation functions. And those are, uh, of course, related to the Euler equation. So one can write down the following two Kubo formulas, that the real part, this is the dissipated part of eta and zeta, just get related to the transfers and longitudinal pieces of the current current correlation functions. But the way in which omega and q are entering here are very different from the way they enter in the conductivity Kubo formula. Okay? And actually these results are even valid in the superfluid state, provided you suitably interpret zeta as the uh, bulk viscosity zeta sub 2. Then he used Kramer's tronic, which is causality implies analytically properties of the Lehmann spectral representation and operator commutation relations to show that these two guys are just related to thermodynamic quantities. And here are the results. Okay, uh, let's forget about uh, how to regulate the ultraviolet divergences. There are some very, very uh, beautiful things that you have to do in order to get sensible answers, but there just doesn't seem to be time for that. So here are the two sum rules, and the next transparency is I'm going to tell you what the consequences of those sum rules are. So the bulk viscosity sum rule is that it gets related to pressure minus energy minus density times adiabatic speed of sound, but the whole thing can be written in terms of contact. And the shear viscosity sum rule has this rather more complicated form, which has an energy density and the contact. So they look simple at some level, but it's not obvious what they will tell us, so let me tell you what they do tell us. So what do we learn from the eta sum rule, okay? The first thing we learn is a new tail, that there's a universal tail which goes like square root of omega, 
with contact as its coefficient. The second thing is that such subrule provides a constraint for numerical procedures for analytically continuing QMC data from imaginary time and to better frequency to real frequencies. And many quantum Monte Carlo people are interested in calculating this uh, despite all the problems of maximum entropy and so on and so forth. And third, they provide a constraint for approximate calculation. So an approximate calculation is my friend Willy Zwerger beat me to it. And uh, so they published uh, some conserving approximations and they checked that actually they used our sum rule uh, to make sure that everything was OK. And uh, so that's good. Okay. But let me now, so we unfortunately have made no progress towards proving the minimum value of eta. Okay. But that's as far as we have been able to go on exact results for eta. But actually, we have something very cute uh, with zeta and an experimental proposal. So in the next five minutes, let me tell you about that. So here's the zeta sum rule. Okay? And it's very easy to show analytically that at unitarity, the right-hand side vanishes. Okay, either you can just directly show that this vanishes, or if you look at this, all you have to show that this derivative is finite. You have a Varnova raised squared, so it vanishes. You can take the value of this quantity from quantum Monte Carlo, because this is, after all, uh, just a thermodynamic measurement. And you can see that this sum rule vanishes at unitarity with a quadratic minimum. But if it vanishes at unitarity, that is actually wonderful, OK? Because you've shown that the integral of a positive definite quantity vanishes. Positive definite, because the second law of thermodynamics says that dissipation must be positive definite. Hence, you've shown that this entire function as a function of frequency and temperature is identically zero. If you show that some function as a function of frequency and temperature is entirely zero, that clearly demands a hand waving explanation. So the hand waving explanation is next. Okay, so I'm literally going to wave my hands, okay? So suppose I imagine doing Boltzmann theory. Then, of course, uh, when I'm thinking about bulk viscosity, I'm asking how fast do I relax to equilibrium after uniform dilation. But since I have this neural bar, a uh, quantum critical point or conformally invariant point, it's, you could wave your hands and say that the wave function just has no scale, and so you never leave equilibrium. And therefore, this hand waving argument tells you that zeta should be zero. Now, the reason why this hand waving argument is purely hand waving, unlike the sub rule that I gave you previously, which is completely rigorous, is because actually there are multiple scales in the problem. There's a temperature, there's a Fermi energy, and there's a frequency at which I'm doing this measurement. And yet, at unitarity, that entire function vanishes. So that then also leads to another interesting prediction. Okay? As I said, that, so again I'm dropping the real parts here, that a linear combination of eta and zeta, which is simply related to the imaginary part of the longitudinal current-current correlation function. But precisely at the most interesting point, zeta vanishes, so you can knock that out. Now the continuity equation says that the imaginary part of the longitudinal current-current correlation is just directly proportional to the imaginary part of the density-density correlation function. So we come to the conclusion that at unitarity, this eta as a function of omega just gets related to a density-density correlation function. And this actually is, in principle, measurable. So not in this particular limit, but in other limits, the imaginary part of the density-density correlation function has been measured in those gases using uh, what uh, these uh, people in AMO physics call two-photon Bragg spectroscopy. It's sort of like Raman spectroscopy, but it's stimulated Raman spectroscopy. So you have two lasers, and the angle between them determine the Q that you are imparting, and the frequency difference between them, the omega. And so then you measure density, density function, correlation functions as a function of Q and omega. So I think this is going to be a very challenging experiment when I talk to the experimentalists because there's a Q to the fourth denominator and you're taking Q to the limit to get a finite number. But I have great faith in the ingenuity of my experimental colleagues. If they can do this, this would be the analog of an optical conductivity measurement of the unitary Fermi gas. You can understand spectral weight transfers and all kinds of beautiful things. Okay, so I am more or less on time, even though I rush through it. 
so in summary, what I have presented to you are exact results for the viscosity spectral functions in strongly interacting Fermi gases, some rules for the bulk and shear viscosities, which are valid at all temperatures, all interaction strengths, and all states of matter, normal and superfluid. Uh, new results for high frequency tails. The fact that the bulk viscosity spectral function at unitarity is just identically zero, and a proposal for a spectroscopic measurement of the shear viscosity spectral function. Of course, what I have not succeeded in doing is proving a shear viscosity bound. But I feel that knowing some rules is always a very good first step in proving bounds. At least all the rigorous results we know in equilibrium quantum statistical mechanics, some, some rule underlies them anyway. Okay? So, in conclusion, uh, I think this is a very beautiful thing that there's a confluence of interest in condensed matter, AMO, nuclear, and string theory in trying to understand quantum transport and spectroscopy in situations where quasi-particles are not well defined. Okay? And ultra-cold dilute Fermi gases are really wonderful systems in which one can do a variety of experiments to shed light on uh, this part of strongly interacting Fermi systems. And exact results are always good. They improve our understanding, they help us at interpret experiments, test approximations, and someday maybe to prove bounds as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>